I am Karen Diefenbach. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. We're going to talk about management of reflux in adolescence and um, to wrap or not to wrap. So I have no disclosures. I'm not related to Nissen or any of the other fundoplication pioneers. As you saw, a 16-year-old female with a BMI of 27 and reflux uh, symptoms on maximal omeprazole treatment. So how would you treat in the setting of failure of medical management? Well, I think first we have to agree that she's failed. And is there any other conservative management that you would want to try? So um, many of you, like me, work in a great medical center. We have a um, wonderful GI department. And if they're um, as wonderful as they think they are, um, just kidding, uh, then they've already tried all the conservative management before they get to you. Um, and like most pediatric specialists, they feel it is their mission in life to protect them, the patients from the surgeons. So if the patient's sitting in your office, someone has already admitted failure, and they've sent the patient for the nuclear option of surgical intervention. And as in this case, if she's already symptomatic, she's here for surgery, how are we going to discuss and what are we going to decide for management for her? So I'm going to talk to you about the when, why, and how of taking care of this patient. We all want to do the right thing. And because of her age, you may be thinking, are we sure that Nissen is the right thing? And the answer is yes, it is. And you could ask yourself, is this the right time to do surgery? And the answer is yes. I mean, sure, we could wait a couple of years and until she's 18, and she can make the decision for herself. But we all know what kind of decisions you make at 18, and you don't magically become more mature and able to make the right call. So what we're doing if we're waiting is we're allowing continuous time for esophageal damage and the repercussions of untreated reflux. So in addition to missing a lot of school for her pain and esophageal reflux of heartburn, weight loss, um, Tiffany here has already missed so many days that she's probably not going to be eligible for the homecoming court. And that snake cheerleader, Brittany, is moving in on her man, all right? So if she misses any more days and Brittany steals her boyfriend, she's not going to have a date for the prom. And in addition to the social devastation of being, of being so single at the time of prom, she's going to let her GPA fall. And she's not going to be eligible for any of these highly respected institutions. And I think we've all shown that the days of buying your way in are done. So let's talk about laparoscopic Nissen. In pediatric populations, it's commonly used in infants and young children um, who have comorbid conditions, such as congenital anomalies like CDH or TEF, and neurologic impairment. In adolescence, it's frequently for persistent symptoms or progression of disease despite medical management. Those symptoms can include pain, heartburn, and weight loss. They're frequently associated with disability days from school, and depending on the age of the child, that also translates to disability days for the parent. And then in addition to that, you can have progression of disease where you start getting the side effects, the um, complications of reflux, such as erosive <coughs> esophagitis or Barrett's esophagus. Now the complications in reflux for kids um, are, can be severe. So Barrett's esophagus, this is a study done in 2011 that looked at um, whether this is a significant concern. And what we find is that it actually does occur in kids in all age groups, even the zero to five years. It's more common in the adolescent group. And that's typically because the treatment is not effective. It's been managed with medications. But the surveillance is less frequent in kids, and therefore the symptom or the finding is present at a later date. Um, in addition, when you look at the long-term effects, when we're talking about Barrett's and erosive esophagitis, the risks of that are really related to duration of symptoms and severity of symptoms. So exposure is a huge thing. In this study that was based on, is a population-based study on uh, participants in Utah, what they found was that children that had reflux had a 30 times higher risk of developing Barrett's esophagus or esophageal cancer than the general population. So if this is untreated with their life expectancy, this is a significant problem. So what are the indications for fundoplication? Why would you do it? 
In kids, um, the pediatric gastroenterologists and two of their societies, the American Society and European Society, came together and put together a clinical practice guidelines. And in it, they discuss the indications for surgical management. These include life-threatening complications of gastroesophageal reflux disease. In kids, those are called ALTIs, or acute life-threatening events. Uh, and in addition, it also includes cardiorespiratory failure, failure of optimal medical management, so they're still having symptoms, even on medication. If they have chronic medical co comorbidities with complications of reflux, reflux, such as failure to thrive, aspiration pneumonia, um, or the need for ongoing medical therapy to control symptoms. Once they try to wean them off medications, they're un unable to do so and have recurrence of symptoms. Um, <clears throat> complications in surgical intervention. So if you decide to do the surgery, what are the risks that you incur to do that? So this is the largest series in children presented at two in 2013 by Dr. Rothenberg, in which over 2,000 patients were there. Um, what he showed is there's a relatively low risk of complications. In primary Nissen's, meaning the first time it's done versus redo Nissen's, you can see that the complications are higher in redo Nissen's, both intraoperative and postoperative, as you would expect, um, but overall still very low. The success rate, obviously it depends on how you define success. In Rothenberg's series, he just defines a two or describes a 95% resolution of symptoms. Mattioli, in um, his study in 2004, um, talked about complete resolution of symptoms versus partial resolution of symptoms with decreased medication doses. And you can see from there, we're still in the, you know, 95% range. The durability of the procedure is affected by multiple factors, including the time at which you do it. Um, other comorbid conditions, but we know that it does diminish over time. In Capito in 2008, the recurrence of symptoms was separated in neurologically normal versus impaired children. And as you would expect, in neurologically impaired children, those with retching, seizure disorders, um, the recurrence of symptoms was higher at 12% versus 2% in the normal patients. The quality of life after Nissen has been something that is not well studied in either adults or children. There are a few studies out there in which they do a good job looking at a validated questionnaire. Um, however, in kids, the data is limited, and especially, and especially in adolescents. The above studies were all in adults and do show a benefit in quality of life improvement, uh, initially with 85 to 95 percent being successful at resolution of symptoms and improving their quality of life. But long term, that number decreases. Now, there are some, some confounding factors with that. For example, other health uh, related issues that come up as you age. And that may play into the decreased quality of life from a medical perspective. When comparison, comparing other treatments, there's no randomized control studies that compare laparoscopic Nissen versus these alternative therapies in kids. Um, they're poor quality studies, limited case series. Um, and most of them are retrospective comparisons. The main comparison in the pediatric population is between open and laparoscopic Nissen, and I think we can all pretty much agree that MIS is the better approach. Um, the limitations of evidence from a poor quality studies, most studies in pediatrics are of the entire age group, and this is very different depending on the etiology and the age um, in the young patients or infants versus the adolescents. And in addition, the combined data from pediatric patient populations have different risk profiles. Oh, that's it. I'm going to turn my talk over to Kim Kane. <laughs>